first, are there any questions? No, not right now. Remember, I have chocolate. Okay, I'm going to talk about something uh, about, well, two or three different things today. Um, remember, we started out talking about uh, spontaneous symmetry breaking and then did Goldstone's theorem. And um, maybe we should call it Nambu's theorem and Goldstone's theorem. Um, <clears throat> what I want to do today is to quickly review that. Oh, it, it, I, I hope it will be boring. But then I want to apply it to the case of the pion. And um, the pion is thought to be a Nambu Goldstone boson. I want to explain why that's the case. What we so saw was that if we have a conserved current and we define the charge as usual as the integral of J0, and if the charge doesn't annihilate the vacuum but instead makes some state which I can call S for state and 0 for and I'll show you why it's zero in a minute. It has zero momentum. Um, then what we saw was that H on S zero was the same thing as H on Q of zero. But because this is a conserved charge, this commutes with the Hamiltonian. And the result is that we can replace this by the commutator of H with Q. Um, let me get this right. H Q. Is this also hold a zero? It, hold it, hold it. Is this Sorry. also a zero energy eigenstate? That's what I'm trying to show. Um, ah, that's right. So this is H Q, but this is also Q H because this commutes, and um, oh, this was so transparent to me, and now it's, I'm not getting it to work. Um, Certainly, you can. Okay, so uh, once again, we have a conserved current, but if the charge doesn't annihilate the vacuum, then indeed um, we have a state that uh, is of zero energy, and moreover, we can define the state at momentum k as simply integral e to the minus i k dot x j0 of x and t, say, uh, vacuum uh, d cubed x. In the limit, k going to 0, this just goes over to s and 0. And I, we showed in class that this is a state of momentum k. Ti on SK is K on SK. So this is a state of momentum K that uh, has zero energy when the momentum goes to zero. That's what we mean by a zero mass state. So, um, so that's uh, the, the name, that's the Goldstone theorem, and the, the zero mass particles are called named Goldstone particles. Okay. Let's go back into the 1960s when um, people were looking at decays such as pi minus goes to mu minus plus uh, nu mu bar, or pi minus goes to e minus plus nu e bar, and so forth. 
In other words, weak decays of hadrons. And uh, they wrote down a Lagrangian, which was the Fermi constant. This was before they knew about um, the electroweak theory. <coughs> and then they wrote this as uh, J mu, well, let me use a lower mu here, J mu minus J5 mu, like that. Um, and the reason why there's a 5 in here is that the weak interactions don't conserve parity, which was pointed out by Yang and Lee. And the possibility was pointed out by Yang and Lee back in the 50s, and Madame Wu at Columbia. Um, but is, is E the charge, or is that the electron? E is the electron field. Oh, it's the field, okay. And then and is the, the field? field? Okay. And what really happens in the real theory is L is equal to something like um, uh, let me just write it like this D mu uh, nu and um, I forget exactly how they let's just let me just put in the 1 minus gamma pi by hand. And then the d mu has a, uh, a gauge boson in it. It's, that's the covariant derivative. And um, Remind me what gamma 5 is again? That's the product. Gamma of 5 of is a matrix that um, anti commutes with all the four gamma matrices. And in fact, um, if we were living in four dimensions of space and one of time, then we'd have five gamma matrices, gamma five and the fifth gamma matrix. Okay, so um, this is an effect of Lagrangian for weak decays. And uh, let's recall that if we had a matrix element between two states, of momentum by translation invariance, translational invariance, this is e to the minus i, p prime minus p dot x, p prime j5 mu of zero. So what is j5? Oh, I'm sorry, duh, these are currents. So is the, the five on J5, is that, what does that mean? That means axial vector. That means that it's, that this is a vector current, this is an axial vector okay. current. So under parity, mm -hmm. it changes sign, or rather, it doesn't change sign because right. the vector changes sign. And um, sorry, <coughs> and What's really going on here is one of these currents is, again, something like, um, let us say, I don't know, u bar gamma mu uh, 1 minus gamma 5 uh, d, say. Okay. And then if you had, th if this thing was, if you replace the gamma mu, well, this is d slash, actually. So and if you replace this by, gamma mu by d slash, then what you've got is you've got in the theory this term, you've got this term, you've got an f mu nu squared, okay? So the, the possible, this thing has a vertex which is something like, I don't know, d goes to u and a w comes out. Are the gamma 5 and the j 5 both artifacts of the fact that there's a neutrino field? Because I don't remember, we've, we never talked about these types of Lagrangians before. Yeah, you're right. Um, it's because, it's because the weak interactions maximally violate parity. Okay. And um, this is, there are many, I don't know, but the fact is there are many embarrassments 
about particle physics, the infinities of the worst embarrassment, dark energy is another embarrassment, um, and why parity is broken maximally is another embarrassment. Um, Anyway, I, I, this is all an aside. Um, I wasn't, it's not in my notes. That's why I'm seeing them a bit sketchy. But, all right. So, with using Lorentz invariance, charge conjugation invariance, and isospin symmetry, you can argue that J5 mu at zero, you see, Dependence on x is just the phase factor, so this is the thing we have to worry about. And this is equal, to, you can write it in the form, u bar of p prime, gamma mu, gamma phi, some function, f of q squared, plus q mu, gamma phi, another function of q squared, u of p. This is a little bit like what we did when we were doing electromagnetic loop diagrams. Q is P prime minus P. Okay. Now, um, also in the in simply the K of the pion, what you have is simply J5 mu, because the pion is a pseudoscalar, and you parameterize this as F K mu. It's um, at zero, say. Otherwise, it's a phase factor. But the, uh, the, this thing has to depend upon, has to be some vector, and the only available vector, if this is the vacuum, is the momentum of the pion. And uh, so this is some constant times k mu. Now, what this tells you then is that the pion decay rate pi minus to whatever, say e minus plus nu e bar, this thing is proportional to f squared, because this is the, it would be, the amplitude would be proportional to f, its probability proportional to f squared. Okay. Now, the observation that people made after the Goldstone theorem was that the pion is the latest, uh, Latest. The lightest hadron, at least at the time, it was the lightest known hadron. Now, the fact that we are down four is the less or lower, but for it's still the lightest hadron that uh, isn't confined. And so, somebody or other, I forget who, said, "Gee, maybe the pion is the boson of J5." Jane Yu, it turns out, is conserved. Let me um, say, what is, what, how is J5? Well, let's multiply this equation by K Mu. Then we get K Mu, 0, J5 Mu, uh, K, is then F K squared, which is F Y squared. And of course, this thing is, this thing is essentially telling you that the conserved current. In other words, this thing is the same thing as zero apart from, I don't know, minus i. It's uh, d mu j mu phi of zero k is equal to that. In other words, doing it more exactly, let me just do it more exactly. j mu phi of x k is zero j five mu zero k e to the minus i kx. So 0 d mu j mu phi of x k is minus i k mu 0 j phi mu 0 k e to the minus i kx, which is minus i f, well, let me do, do, do this in two steps minus i um, I'll do it in three steps k mu f k mu e to the minus i kx and so this is minus i k 
squared f e to the minus i a x, which is minus i m pi squared f e to the minus i k x. Okay, so what that's saying then is that the divergence of the axial vector current is proportional to the square of the pion mass because the pion is so light, it's almost conserved, nearly conserved. Did you say the pion is the the gauge boson that appears in no, the... No, 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 no. Pion is not a gauge boson. So where does the... I mean, are we talking about this de decay? Pion is a boson, but not a gauge boson. Are we talking about this decay of pi minus to... Yeah. So where is there a pion in the Lagrangian? Ah, there isn't a pion in the Lagrangian. Um, that's, that's sort of the spirit of this, of this current stuff. That's what happened was, you see, you have many, many, many different bosons and fermions. And the idea really is that, the, I mean, the modern point of view is that everything would be written in terms of quarks, leptons, and gauge bosons. And then the Higgs. Okay. Um, the point was that you can, you can write things in an effective Lagrangian in terms of currents, and these currents are going to be looking, are going to look like this. And these are quark fields? These are quark fields. Okay. And the pion is quark anti quark. Mm -hmm. So this thing here is 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 the way the pion decays. I mean the pi minus, well, it's a little more tricky than that because um, that the pi minus, it, it looks like this. It's, say, a, a, uh, a D and an anti-U. That's what you can think of the pi minus as. Uh, decays into a W mm -hmm. minus, which then decays into an electron and a, an anti-electron neutrino. So that's what's really happening. But um, another way of thinking about it is in terms of these currents, and the point is that this axial vector current is proportional to the square of the mass of the pion, and so it's nearly conserved. Because the axial vector, vector current is nearly conserved, we should imagine that there is, by virtue of the Goldstone theorem, a particle that nearly has zero mass, and that's the pi. I mean, so we've got we've got a. It's a lot we, bigger than the electron mass, isn't it? Yeah, but among the strongly interacting <coughs> particles, it's very light. The 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 pion mass is of the order of 140. Yeah, it's like a 10. MeV, the proton. proton mass or the nucleon mass is of the order of. 940 MeV. So the ratio is like 15%. So if it were a perfect symmetry, then the, the pion mass would be zero. Yes. If the axial vector current were really, the idea is that if the axial vector current were really conserved, the mass of the pion would be zero. Yeah. And the pion would be the Nambu Goldstone boson of the axial vector of symmetry caused by the symmetry of the but by the conservation of the axial vector current and by the fact that the axial vector charge doesn't annihilate the vacuum. Now, there's a weak point in this argument. I haven't shown you why it is that the axial vector charge does not annihilate the vacuum. That's, that would be part of this and um, Well, I suppose the reason it doesn't is if you ask, well, what is this axial vector current? This axial vector current is essentially something like U bar and D. And U bar D hitting the vacuum doesn't give you zero. So that's sort of what's coming. All right, let me just go through a little more of this. But if you have more questions, Go for them. All right. Uh, let me see. Have I already done this? All 
right, let's go back to this equation here. So we've said that this thing is nearly uh, conserved, and so we can consider P prime minus P mu, which is the same thing as Q mu, P, my, uh, P prime times P prime uh, J five mu of X P, which is the same thing as P prime D mu J mu five of X P. So this is approximately zero. On the other hand, it's equal to um, well, maybe I should add another step here. It's P prime, let's pull out the derivative. It's D mu P prime J mu five of zero P E to the I P prime minus P X. And so pulling that down, you see this is, so it should be your I. So when you differentiate on the x, you get i, p prime minus p mu times that, which is, which is also i, p prime minus p mu, p prime j five mu of zero, p e to the i, p prime minus p x. So that's the whole picture. That's more or less zero. But now let's use this expression for J5, uh, zero. And so that's telling us that P prime minus P mu, P prime J5 mu of zero P, which is equal to P prime minus P mu, mu bar of P prime, gamma mu gamma five, f of q squared plus q squared, no, plus q mu, gamma five, g of q squared, u of p, so this is all approximately zero. <coughs> and we pull this thing through, and what we get is that this is u bar of p prime. This will be p, p prime slash minus p slash gamma five f of q squared plus q squared gamma five g of q squared u of t. Approximately zero. Okay. Now. Because well, q is p prime minus p. Yes. All right. Now, let's use the Dirac equation. Namely, um, first of all, we can rewrite this as p prime slash gamma five plus gamma five p slash because, as I pointed out over here, gamma mu and gamma five anti commute. Moreover, there's the Dirac equation, which says p slash u of p is m u of p, where m is whatever the mass is of these states, and these are nucleon states, so that's m. I already said that the states that we're talking about here are nucleon states. This is a pion state, so this is a pion, and these are nucleon states. Okay. Um, the, the U bar stuff is the following. U bar P prime, P prime slash is also MN U bar of P prime. Remember the U B. It has to do with the hermeticity of the gamma mu's and it's a gamma mu's um, 
and, and u bar has a gamma zero. All right, so what do we find then? What we find is that this whole expression here is u bar of p prime, 2n nucleon, gamma 5, f of q squared, plus q squared gamma 5, g of q squared, u of p is approximately 0. And so that gives us a, an equation, 2 mass nucleon, f of q squared, plus q squared g of q squared, approximately 0. Now, if you take the limit q squared going to 0, then this would say that the, uh, oh, well, first of all, what is f of, f of 0? f of 0 is what's measured in beta decay. So this is not 0. On the other hand, the limit q squared going to 0, that would tell you the mass of the nucleon is 0, and that would not be a good result. And especially since we started out this whole discussion by saying the mass of the nucleon was huge compared to the mass of the fire. But on the other hand, what we said is that, well, for one, uh, is that this q squared we're thinking of as the momentum transfer of the pion, and moreover, since the pion is essentially massless, this thing we expect to have a pole at uh, zero. And so, in other words, the idea is that g of q squared is something like f g pi n n over q squared. So the q squareds cancel, then we get the relation. 2m nucleon f of q squared, or f of 0, let us say, plus f g pi n n is approximately 0. And people, let's see, I do not like the fact that they're both, they're both adding up to 0. Um, somehow there's a minus sign here somewhere. Oh, let me just put a minus sign there, minus sign there. And then we get that F, or that, um, that F g pi n n is of the order of 2 m n F of 0. So this is called the Goldberger Tremont relation. Tremont spell locks Anyway, so this this is the pion nucleon constant, which has a value around 13. Um, this is the constant measured in beta decay, and this is the pion decay constant. These this is experimentally more or less true. And um, it's an example of, let, let me just emphasize something here. You see, because of the strong interaction, the strong interactions are non nonlinear, non and the coupling constant is strong, you can't do perturbation theory. Or even in QCD, you can't do perturbation theory. I mean, you can do it, but it's only valid at very, very high energy. And these are low energy phenomena. And so you can't calculate F or G. And um, you might be able to calculate this these days. But in any event, if this gives you a relationship <coughs> between these two mysterious quantities. And so it's. When you, when you don't have a theory you can solve, you can somehow you know, stand on your head and be very clever and figure out some way in which you can relate two things that you don't know how to calculate. So that's what that is. That was thought to be a triumph in those days. When I was a graduate student, this was very interesting. Okay, now I want to switch to something totally different.
unless there are questions, in which case I can pause. All right. Solitons. Um, the sol solitons are, the solitons show up very naturally and easily in one, uh, the space times of one space dimension and one time dimension. When you go up in space, then um, it's, it's harder to find them. Um, they occur, and an example is the magnetic monopole. But um, the theories that people normally talk about don't generate solitons easily and simply in three plus one dimensions. So let's just look at it in, in two dimensions. And let's just look at a neutral scalar field. This is our Lagrangian. So what we mean here is a half phi dot squared minus a half grad phi squared minus V of phi, and this might be um, a half, just go back to this notation, minus lambda over 4, P squared minus P squared squared. That's one of the simplest, but there are others, and uh, I'll get to them at the end of the hour. Question? All right, well, what's the energy of some sort of a soliton? Well, the mass of the thing, or the energy, is going to be an integral dx. We're in one space dimension. We can set the time derivative to be 0. So we're just dealing with, and remember, the, the Lagrangian is the kinetic term, this one, minus the potential. So what we've got is a half phi prime squared plus v of phi. And so for the case of the king, this is an integral minus infinity to plus infinity, a half phi prime squared plus, say, lambda over 4, phi squared minus v squared squared. So that's the uh, dx. So that's the mass of the thing. And now we can say some qualitative things about this. The qualitative thing is <coughs> we know that if we go to plus infinity or minus infinity, phi has to approach v or minus v. Okay. Now, when we were talking about this theory in the past, what we did was we said, well, this looks like this, and so we're going to quantize about this minimum ignore that, and we're going to say, in fact, that the Hilbert space built around this vacuum and the Hilbert space built around that vacuum are completely orthogonal. All right. So now, for, for x going to plus and minus infinity, why does phi have to go to v? Oh, otherwise, you'd have an integral of phi squared minus v squared, which would be non-zero, and you'd be integrating out to infinity, and you'd get an infinite mass. So let me show you how you can get a finite mass, though. And you sort of, well, let me just show you. <coughs> it's called the kink. Also, what is this? This is the mass of what? Of phi? This, no. Okay. <laughs> phi is a field. Right. So it's a concept. Concepts don't have masses. Um, sorry, I'm being a smart ass. Um, <laughs> I didn't get it, so that's okay. Right. Um, um, what, what mass? This is the mass of what? All right. There are two masses involved. There's the mass, which we'll call mu, of the vibrations around the minimum. And then there's another mass, which we'll call capital M, which is the mass of another topologically stable field configuration, and it's called the kink. And the example of the king is that we have here, this is equal to minus v, this is equal to plus v, and this is a finite energy configuration well, where it, it... What is the vertical scale? Phi. Okay. X. Space. 
So in other words, at minus x equal to minus infinity, <coughs> the field phi is minus v. It's sitting in this vacuum, no energy, or very little. Then at some point it goes, and you have it goes to the other vacuum. So this is like the revolution in Tunisia. Which is one government. Okay, so that's one possibility. Another possibility is an anti king So it could be like this. So it could be V at minus infinity. And minus V at plus infinity. And zero could be, say, there. And, basic, and this is basically topologically stable. And in fact, there's actually something very cute. You can write a conserved current <coughs> as being epsilon mu nu uh, d nu of phi. And the reason that's conserved, of course, is that d mu j mu is then epsilon mu nu d mu d nu of phi. This is symmetric, this is anti symmetric, so it's zero. So you have a conserved charge, conserved current, I should say, um, and a conserved charge. And it, um, it uh, doesn't depend upon the details of the Lagrangian. It's not this coming the, uh, from the Noether theorem. This is the current of the Chern Simons gauge field? Well, that has this anti symmetric tensor as well. Let's, let's yeah, let, let, but that's in two plus one dimensions, and this is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, uh, and here, here. Well, we're, we're going to get to the churn signs in a couple of weeks, or a full week. I don't know. But I'm not going to do that today. All right, so we've got a king, we've got an anti king. This conserved current implies that the kink is stable and the anti-kink is stable, but if we have the we have a situation where we say have an anti-kink and then down here a kink, well then if the kink, if the anti-kink is coming toward the kink, they can annihilate. Um, right. <coughs> now Let's just um, do something very crude to estimate this mass. Let's suppose this dimension, the, the distance over which the thing flips, is L. OK, so what's the mass? The mass, then, is basically L times the derivative here, which is of order V over L. This is V over L squared. And then there's a kinetic term, and the kinetic term is zero out here and zero there. But here, you're different from V on a scale of L, and so this is something like L V to the fourth. Because if you said here that, said so say if V was zero, then you'd have V squared squared. And so this, is very, this is very crude. Uh, so this is v squared over L plus LV to the fourth. And now we can differentiate, we can find L by, by differentiating, and we get zero is equal to minus v squared <coughs> over L plus lambda V to the fourth. And this tells us one over L squared is lambda v squared, and that tells us that L is 1 over v square root of lambda. So the... What exactly got differentiated there? I differentiated, this is m of L. And I differentiated m of L with respect to L to find out what the, what the parameter L would be. Is that your question? That, that was mine. All right. So you're the one who gets the candy. Hold on. Yeah, I'll square it in the bottom. This is the last almond drawing, oh, so I go to Costco. That's special. 
Yeah, just uh, it's negative least squared over L squared then. So um, L is equal to that. That's true. Now while we're at it, let's go back and remember what the mass is associated with these vibrations around here. Well, to do that, we say phi is equal to V plus chi. And so L is a half V chi squared minus lambda over 4 V plus chi squared minus V squared squared. I think I may have gone over this too fast several weeks ago when I did this for the first time. So let's just expand this a little bit more carefully. A half V chi squared minus lambda over 4. Well, the V squared term cancels with this term. And what we have left is 2V chi plus chi squared squared. And so this is a half V chi squared minus lambda V squared chi squared minus other terms, minus a cubic term and minus a fourth term. Okay? All right, so that tells us that the mass, this, this we identify with minus mu squared over 2 chi squared, and so uh, mu squared is um, 2 lambda v squared and mu, mu is v square root of lambda, square root of 2. So that tells us something interesting. That tells us that the size of the kink is roughly um, square root of 2 over mu. That's interesting because it's because 1 over mu is the Compton wavelength of the elementary particle in the theory. So the size of the kink is the Compton wavelength of the elementary particle in the theory. What about the mass of the kink? Well, the mass of the kink is, as we saw, v squared over L plus L lambda v to the fourth. And if you combine them, what you get is v cubed square root of lambda plus square root of lambda v to the fourth over v square root of lambda. Well, that's a lambda, not square root. Anyway, this is 2v cubed square root of lambda. Another way of thinking about it is that v squared, in other words, this is um, how did I work this out? Um, you can write this as 2v cubed mu over v root 2 or square root of 2 mu v squared. And of course, v is related to mu and lambda, and if you do that, you get mu cubed over lambda root 2. So you can think of the mass of the kink as the cube of the mass of the elementary particle divided by the coupling constant. Okay. All right, now, what does that mean? That means that if the theory is weakly coupled, the kink mass is huge compared at least to the, um, actually the dimensions are all. Did I screw up here? Why? All right, let me just check. Not, not my notes, but the book that I was supposedly following. Um,
No, it comes out the way I write. Mu squared over square. Mu cubed. Oh, we're in we're in one space and one time. So that, that, that's actually something higher. So I was thinking when I was saying that this dimension seems to be crazy, I was thinking that we were in four dimensions. Three of space, one of time. Then uh, and in that case, um, that case the dimensions would have been screwy. But if we're in one space, one time, let's just think about this. The action is supposed to be dimensionless, right? So um, uh, the, the, let's look at the kinetic term. The kinetic term is, all right, so S is dx dt times a uh, square of derivative. So that means that the dimension of the field is one. That is to say, the field is dimensionless, whereas the field in four dimension has dimension of mass. If the field is dimensionless, then V is dimensionless. But then lambda has dimensions of one over distance squared. So the dimension of lambda is one over L squared, or equivalently, dimensions of m squared. Now let's go over here and see what the dimensions are. Aha! Mass cubed over mass squared mass. Okay. So that's the dimensions do work out. Okay. All right. Now, Talked about the conserved current. All right. Let me mention a uh, an inequality which is rather cute. Um, you get this inequality whenever you can write some quantity, mass, energy, action, whatever, as the square of something plus the square of something else. So in other words, we, we have here is we're saying that the mass is an integral of a of x squared plus b squared of x dx. Well, notice that the integral of a of x plus or minus b of x squared dx is certainly greater than zero. And this is the integral of a squared plus b squared plus or minus 2ab dx. And so we get that the integral of a squared plus b squared dx is greater than or equal to the absolute value, well, twice the absolute value of the integral of ab. And so now, what are A, B in this case? Well, A, well, unfortunately, I've got these damn factors of one half. Um, um, I've somehow, oh, that's all right. A is 1 over root 2 phi prime, and B is square root of lambda over 2 uh, phi squared minus phi squared. Okay, looking at that thing over there, right? Okay. So this thing is greater than or equal to 2 absolute value, the integral of. Um, lambda over, no, square root of lambda over 2 root 2 b prime times b squared minus b squared dx absolute value. Right. This is an easy integral to do exactly independent of 
essentially a fee because, sorry, so let me pull out all this stuff. Square to lambda, well, square to lambda over 2, isn't it? When we're done, let me pull that out. Absolute value, and now what is this interval? Well, this is the derivative of phi cubed over 3, and this is the derivative of minus phi v squared. So it's this thing evaluated at infinity minus infinity in absolute value. Okay? And so for the kink, this thing is v cubed over 3, and this is v cubed over 3. And um, notice that both for the kink and the anti-kink, for the kink, it's v cubed minus v cubed at plus infinity, and then at minus infinity, it's minus v cubed plus v cubed. Okay. And for the anti-kink, it's the opposite. Anyway, it's the same. So what we get is that the mass of the kink and the anti-kink are greater than or equal to lambda over 2. And when I did this this afternoon, all right, let me just get this straight. It's this is, let's take this to be the big term. This is v cubed minus v cubed over 3. So it's 2 thirds v cubed. But because there are two of them, it's 4 thirds v cubed. Okay, so that's the, that's the answer. All right. And this is an example of an unpronounceable bond, uh, uh, a theorem. It's a Bogol... Bogoliubov? Huh? No, not Bogoliubov. No. Uh, some other Bogol. <laughs> and, all right, hold on a second. Bogomolny. Bogomolny. And this thing had, is used in string theory. Well, it's used in a lot of fancy field theory and string theory. It's very cute, though, you see. It, um, it comes from, I mean, you know, anything that comes out, this simply is, is and notice that it's topological, because um, you had, because you're, the, the way I evaluated this is that I said that plus infinity had to be either V or minus V. Okay. Right. And it had to be V at one end and minus V at the other, or minus V at one end and V at the other. Because we're talking about a kink or an anti-kink. Mm -hmm. Notice that if instead of being a kink or an anti-kink, it were just um, uh, an elementary particle in theory, or it were a kink-anti-kink -kink pair, then I would have gotten a bound that the mass was uh, greater or equal to zero, which of course it should be. But what does is, what is this, these boundary conditions have to do with topology and the topology of what space? In physics, with theoretical physics, you sometimes throw around the word topological in a mm -hmm. casual way, of okay. um, First of all, this is a topological, this is a conserved current topological reasons. And the thing that's conserved is, um, you can think of it as a charge, and the charge is basically the kink number. So in other words, it's V minus V. Or uh, what actually Z does is you divide by 2V. So it's the Are you saying this is topological because there's no metric in there? It's topological because the conservation of this thing Occur, occurs independently of Lagrangian. That's true. Secondly, it's that the the kink goes from one vacuum to the other. The anti-kink goes from this vacuum to that vacuum. Um, it's actually an example of a homotopy group very trivial sort in the sense that um, as you go out to spatial infinity, you've got to be in either V or minus V. 
spatial infinity consists of two points. Spatial infinity is the sphere of zero dimension. So well, I mean, each point is, you're saying each point is S0. Here. V and minus V form a group as a Z2, the thing that you guys have been analyzing. In fact, um, what's your name again? Aaron. Well, it's James on the list, but whichever. James or Aaron, take your pick. James or Aaron, okay. Anyway, so um, James actually worked out the vacuum. We'll end a little early and he can tell us what he did in the morning. It's quite nice. Anyway, so this is a map from the zero dimensional circle into Z2. I'll, I'll get back to this another time. Um, let me now give you some more examples of this soliton because there are some nicer, the, 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 there's another theory where, where the topology is a little more. What makes this a soliton? What makes it a soliton? Yeah. Just... Well, it's, all right, let's put it this way. The, the, the word soliton was first introduced well, I don't know even when it was first introduced, but the first soliton was noticed as a water wave in, in fact, it was a small tsunami, I guess. Somebody was going down a canal, okay, and he noticed that the level of water was like that, and the thing was moving like that. Okay. Might have been that there was an earthquake, or maybe there was a dam opened and shut, one of the locks opened or shut and it shot a water wave down. And what he noticed was that this thing moved with a constant height at a constant speed. And he called it a solid. And people later, at some, either he or somebody later called it a solid. They, they sometimes are called solitons because they sometimes have funny scattering. In some of these theories, you can, cons you can analyze the scattering of solitons, and it turns out they just go past each other um, without noticing, essentially. I mean, something funny happens when the, when the kinks hit each other, but in the final state, the, 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 original, the original kink was moving like this, and the final, at later time, it's moving like that, and the other one, the opposite. So, um, so in a sense, they're solitary objects. Um, back in the mid-70s, this was a field of active research, and my view at the time was we ought to just call, call a soliton anything that's a finite energy field configuration. Because, uh, how shall I say, uh, stable. All right, so let me just mention um, we, we've been talking about, right, let me switch now to Coleman's notation, which is slightly different, slightly different convention. His potential U is, in one case, lambda over 2, B squared minus A squared squared. This is the kink situation. And let me tell you what the actual solution of the kink is. It's exact. In fact, I worked it out on my own before these things became popular. Didn't publish it until it became popular. It was really stupid. I was surrounded by faculty members who were really stupid. So I don't know this. All right, this is it. It's hyperbolic tangent A, hyperbolic tangent of mu x. And one of the amusing things is notice there's an A here. This A is that A, as of course it um, would have to be. Uh, and um, the fact that the size of the field, the size of the lump, is specified rather than being arbitrary. If you have a linear field, a, li a linear field theory, then the solutions all have arbitrary size. 
But in the nonlinear theory, the size is specified because of the non because it's nonlinear. So that's what that looks like. Another theory, let me just is what's called the sine Gordon equation, and it's u equal to alpha over beta squared, one minus cosine of beta v. So this is the potential energy in the what's called the sine <coughs> Gordon equation. I've never liked that name. It's just Terrible joke, right? There was a Klein Gordon equation, the sine of the I think it's loathsome. Um, Plus it's a cosine. And it's a cosine, yeah, but you differentiate, you get a sine. Um, the theory in the sine Gordon case is phi is 4 over beta arctan of exp of square root of alpha times x. Okay. Now, but what's interesting about the sine Gordon theory, even though I don't like the name, here, let me give you these so we can do a spiel in a second. What's interesting here is that now the vacuum, now there are many, many vacua. Obviously, where's the vacuum? T equals zero. And phi equal to what? N pi over beta? Or is it 2 n pi? Let's see. Oh, phi is the size of cosine. Okay. Right. Oh, so, so I'm sorry, I used two different <laughs> things for phi. But no, I thought beta I didn't know it was n pi, so. It's an argument. Actually, it's 2 n pi. So these are the vacuums. All right? So now the topological current is, um, the topological charge can take an arbitrary integral value. Okay, because you can, you can have something that, that goes from N1 to N2, and it can do that in several jumps. Okay, why don't you, why don't you tell us, show us what you found. There's not too much going on. I you modified the uh, Poitras code. Right, it's in four dimensions. dimensions, and I just changed it to two, three, and five dimensions. It wasn't really that complicated. Space-time dimensions. Yes. It wasn't really that complicated, just a, a break here and there, and that was about it. Um, this shows that uh, for, effectively, for two dimensions, there is no hysteresis loop, therefore there is no so no is this, sort of thing. <coughs> is this using the Metropolis algorithm or the heat back algorithm? Mm -hmm. When he does the hysteresis like this, this? It's it's I mean he's starting at uh, ordered heating it up and then right, but what, it so down. what are you doing at each link of the lattice though? You're updating. You're well, are, are you doing the he's metropolis? Updating this way. Doing You're metropolis? always doing they're always doing metropolis. George, metropolis. metropolis. He talks about What's the difference between metropolis and heat battle? I don't know. The same. He talks about three it's different three different ones in his papers. He call, he explicitly says there's the metropolis one, which is the one I've been using. And then there's the heat bath algorithm, which I'm not sure how it's different. And then there's like a hybrid approach. Alright. I I'm not sure what the heat bath thing is. Uh, okay. So I don't know how to get that hysteresis when you're doing the metropolis. Steps. It's the code that I put on the web. No, page. I know. You compile it and you run it and you'll That's get the thing for four dimensions. It doesn't That's appear to be doing any sort of metropolis. No, no, no. Oh, no, it must be doing the metropolis step, isn't it? Actually, I didn't look at the code that carefully, so I just assumed it was. It's possible. It didn't look like it, though. I, so think, I think each, each update means that you go all the way through the lattice and do a metropolis update on every link. No, right. that's true. That is true. Yeah, you're right. Yes. And up, one update should on be every link. A metropolis thing on every link. If you yes. Need that's an yeah, update. Yeah, that's update right. means yes. you go through. Yeah. Now, uh, you know, he means something else, but he failed. I don't know what it is. I I've, always, I've essentially always used metropolis. In fact, I'm running a metropolis scheme right now, but not for. So, so then what's the, so what's the process? You're varying beta. Varying beta from a cold start, mm -hmm. so one going up, and then going back down. 
So you heat up and you cool mm -hmm. down. And if you don't follow the same path, this is tree system. Mm -hmm. And that means you have a first order phase transition. And remember, we had a theorem that weren't any of these kinds of phase transitions in two dimensions. So how many updates are you doing for each beta? Um, uh, it's I think it's one. You just, it's thousands of beta. It shouldn't be one. It's in thousands of beta, and I forgot the limits on beta. Zero to one, right? Yeah, oh, yeah, beta goes from zero to one. Beta goes from zero to one, it's in thousands of beta steps. Oh, so I see, okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, right. So you're only updating once at each value of beta, and then you're keeping the same configuration. Yeah, but you're changing beta only by one part in a thousand. But then you're, you're keeping, so you, you start with an order to start, for instance. Right. You run the update once right. at beta yeah. equals zero. And then you increment You get one right at once. <laughs> yes. Uh, then you go then to beta equal, equal to... Uh, 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 you go to beta equals point oh 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 one, And you run the... Oh, oh, one. And you run the update again. Right. And you get you a new... You update yeah. every link in the lab. Right? You get a new configuration. In your right. interaction. Yeah. It gives you something a little bit smaller. Yeah. The yes. average plaquette. Right. Now, do you... And then you go do you to, keep that configuration as you change beta, or yes. do you reset yeah, yeah, that yeah. configuration? You start, you start with the, in other words, after you've done it once, you now change beta to point oh oh two. Right. Update every Metropolis link, and uh, so it seems strange to me that you. Uh, and you then you get a slight. You don't reset your configuration and run multiple updates. And then average them. Why? Well, yeah. you could. You yeah. could. Let's put it this way. You could, what you could do is you could change by one part in a thousand, but instead of updating the, uh, updating every link once, you could update every link ten times. Well, so for Z, there's, di there's a difference with that too, because there's, there's a way you can do the Metropolis step a certain number of times at each link, and then there's... Oh, you no, I didn't mean that. I didn't mean oh, that. I well, you can also do that, but for yeah, Z2, it doesn't matter. It doesn't make a difference for Z2. For higher order simpler groups, it would matter, or any other group. That can make the algorithm converge faster. But, okay, so you only do one update at each value of beta. Yep. All right. And then you have fifth. And that's the different dimensions? Yeah. Okay. So, second, two dimensions, three dimensions, four dimensions. Mm -hmm. There's no loop at all on the two. Mm -hmm. And then he also did five. The fifth mm -hmm. dimension just because bigger hysteresis. There's certain noise in there, yeah, that you could get out with averaging. I'm sure if you did it more than once. Well, that's pretty darn good. It's smoothed. Oh, okay. It's actually it's pretty darn smooth, but mm -hmm. I smoothed it. All right, very nice. So if you want to get a grade on it, you can grade it. <laughs> so you're going to hit the button and turn it off. I'll do it next week. All right. <laughs> <laughs>